Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by asking a few questions about a topic that I know is everyone's favorite, which is the intersection of administrative law and constitutional law. Um, in my small town of Alpine, Utah, we speak of little else. Uh, <laughs> now, there are some people who think of this as um, some sort of distant, esoteric topic. But it's, it's not. You, you, you and I both know that it's, this is part of the functioning of our republic. Uh, in Federalist Number 47, James Madison wrote that the accumulation of all powers, meaning legislative, executive, and judicial, um, is itself something that doesn't just lead to tyranny, it is the very definition of tyranny itself. And, and Tocqueville predicted that if tyranny ever came to the United States, it would take the form of an immense and tutelary power, one that would regulate every minute detail of people's lives. And so these topics are not merely esoteric. They're not merely something that uh, uh, could be described as philosophical. They have a real impact on the rights of individuals, on the freedom of people within a free society. And they're essential toward safeguarding our own liberties because uh, anyone, any country in its constitutional system of government, if it has a constitution, can claim to have a Bill of Rights. But whether or not that Bill of Rights means anything depends for its security, for its enforceability on the protection of the people by means of uh, prohibiting anything that would lead to the excessive accumulation of power in the hands of the few. Um, one of the, and this gets us to, to what you have focused on throughout your academic and professional career in administrative law. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of debate in recent years about whether Chevron and our deference are lawful. Unless or until the Supreme Court changes the law, courts are required to defer to agency interpretations of ambiguous statutes and regulations. But one problem with these rules is that ambiguity may mean different things to different people. Um, so I guess uh, my, my first question for you is, do you think you're more or less likely than others to see a particular provision in a statute or regulation as ambiguous? Um, thank you, Senator Lee. I'm, you know, it's hard to say in, in comparison with, with others since I've, but I do think it's important when looking at one of these cases to, to consider the statute for all that it's worth, right? And sometimes a provision that may seem ambiguous at first blush is, is not ambiguous when you really take into account the, the statute as a whole, um, its structure, how the provisions relate to one another. And I think there's usually a lot of meaning that can be found for the what happens when Congress excessively delegates its power? Is that a problem? Um, well, Senator, the, um, the Supreme Court has recognized in all of its cases relating to the non-delegation principle that, that non-delegation is a cornerstone of separation of powers. Um, the Constitution does give the legislative power to, to Congress, in part because they are democratically accountable to the people. Um, so, so that has always been recognized as an essential principle in our, in our system. You, um, a lot of commentators defend the, the present doctrine on the grounds that it's impossible to formulate a judicially manageable principle um, uh, by which to apply the non-delegation doctrine. It, on, on the other hand, uh, some would argue that um, it's a problem anytime a non-delegable duty is delegated. What's the best way to resolve that dispute? Well, um, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I mean, the Supreme Court has, um, on the one hand, recognized the importance of non-delegation, but used a standard, the intelligible principle standard, to judge whether Congress has, in fact, delegated its authorities. And, um, of course, I would be bound to follow that precedent if I were to be confirmed. Um, and you know, it's 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 a, it's something though that that some justices have raised questions about. And as you know, it's something I've written about in my scholarly writings. Right. When we speak of the judicial manageability of a standard, what, what, are, we, what are we referring to? When we've got a standard that's, uh, whether or not it's judicially manageable, tell us what that means. Um, I think that that standard means, um, you know, is there, a, is there some legal standard that the court can apply in that particular case? Is there some provision of the Constitution um, that the court can, can apply? Okay. Um, 
I don't have anything to add on the substance of, of your calling, college writings. Um, you've done a good job of explaining the content and the context and what you were trying to, comp to accomplish. But I, I do want to take a step back for a minute. Um, there's a new reality that's set in, uh, which we've, we've had more than a few nominees who have been criticized for their college writings. We've even scrutinized at least one nominee's high school writings. There are some things you can write in college that uh, could, uh, could disqualify a person from later service, subsequent service in political life, either in the judiciary or otherwise. For judges, I think the standard should involve whether the writing in questions shows that the person cannot be impartial. And it is quite obviously not what we're dealing with here, not anything close to that. For the most part, I think someone should be allowed to say, look, when I was young and I saw things differently through the eyes of a young person, um, uh, I, I said X. And uh, I'm sure you've reread those articles and, and winced at parts, as you've indicated. Um, there are some passages, and I'm sure some articles, that you wish you hadn't written, or if you were to write today, you would write differently. But I think the same could be said for everyone in this room. The same could be said for everyone I know who went to college and has later gone on to do something else. People grow, they learn, and um, uh, we should allow that uh, those changes to, to be taken into account. There's, there's certainly nothing disqualifying here. And I'm certain that there aren't many people in America who want to be judged by what they said in college. And here's the deeper issue. Uh, judicial nominations, if I can give, yeah. get one more sentence. Uh, judicial nominations have become a blood sport. And we've convinced ourselves that because judges are important, it's all fair game. Um, that's not right. And it shouldn't be the case here. Thank you.